The Old Testament reading for this second Sunday in Advent is from the prophet Malachi, the third chapter, beginning with the first verse. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of old, as in former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner, and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Here ends the reading of the Old Testament lesson. <clears throat> Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The second reading for this morning is from St. Paul's Epistle to the Philippians, the first chapter, beginning with the second verse. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you are all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness. How I yearn for all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless in the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness, that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Here ends the reading of the epistle. God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. 
And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these struck stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then shall we do? And he answered them, Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized, and, Jesus, and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you were authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusations, and be content with your wages. Here ends the reading of the Gospel. church 
by preparing to hear about Jesus. And of course, just like we heard John preach this morning, we do this by repenting, by recognizing that we disobey God in our daily lives, that we don't always listen to our moms or dads or our teachers the way we should, that we don't always treat our friends at school or our brothers and sisters as nice as we should. We recognize that we need to repent. That's how we prepare for the Lord. And then we hear from the Lord through his word that those sins are forgiven. And then we're ready for Christmas. We're ready for the coming of the Lord, no matter when that happens. Because it is all about faith and the forgiveness of sin. And that's how Christians are to live, day by day. Not just preparing for Christmas, but every way, every day, waiting for the Lord. And of course, we remember these very blessed words of Jesus. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Because today we also heard about baptism in the gospel reading. That John was baptizing. Well, guess what? You've been baptized, haven't you? For the forgiveness of your sins. That's how we're prepared to receive the Lord and be prepared for Christmas. Knowing that we've been forgiven by Jesus, the Son of God, who came into this world for a very purpose, to forgive us our sins and give us the gift of eternal life, even as we wait for him now. In Jesus' name, amen. We pray. Dear Father in heaven, help us to repent every day of our sins. Help us to live repentant lives, bearing fruit. In other words, help us to live as those who have been forgiven, forgiving and loving others. Help us to take great joy in the message of the gospel that is proclaimed that our sins have been forgiven through something as simple as water in the world. <coughs> Help us to look forward to that day when you do return in glory, Lord, even as we get ready to receive you this day in the, in the uh, bread and wine of Holy Communion. We thank you for coming to us, for strengthening our faith through such blessed gifts. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> Make his past 
straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill made low, and the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places a level way, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. And so, hearing these words of the prophet, reminded of these words by the evangelist, it's right for us this day to ask ourselves, how are we to prepare the way of the Lord? Even as the people coming to John asked, what shall we then do? How are his paths made straight? How is it that all flesh shall see the salvation of God? Just as John told the people of Israel that day, he preached to them repentance and forgiveness. He was pointing them back to their Savior. And then, of course, he admonished them. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. It does no good to call yourself a Christian and then live as if you weren't. That's what the people were doing then. They claimed to be children of Abraham, that is, children of the promise, and yet they were living contrary to God and His Word. And that's why John used such harsh preaching to the people. He called the people a brood of vipers. Not very kind words for someone who was supposed to be spreading the gospel of Jesus. These words offended. They cut to the heart. It's not very comforting to think that God sees those who sin without repentance as the offspring of snakes. So perhaps John would not have had to eat locust and honey and lived in the wilderness himself if he had made the people feel good, rather than showing them their sins and their need for a Savior. Perhaps John would have been more successful and not ended up with his head on a platter if he hadn't been so offensive in the way he preached. Perhaps, but perhaps, he spoke exactly what the Lord wanted him to speak. Perhaps he used harsh words that the people needed to hear to wake them up, to get them to take notice of just what was at stake and just how seriously the Lord God took their sins. Because what does a person do when he finds a brood of vipers, a den of poisonous snakes in his midst? He kills them. And that is exactly what John the baptizer warns will happen to those who refuse to listen to God's word and repent of their sins. Consider this. The Apostle John, not to be confused with John the baptizer, John the writer of the, event of, of the gospel, wrote, warning us Christians that all of us were once children of wrath. That is, the children of the devil, offspring of the snake from the Garden of Eden. At least that's who we were, a brood of vipers, before God made us his children. And so, cut to the heart at such stern preaching of the law, the people repented, recognizing that, yes, they indeed had fallen away from their Lord. You see, the people knew that they had not been obeying God's word. And so they asked him, what shall we do? And John, anticipating the words which our Lord Jesus himself would speak later, says, Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. In other words, John is telling the people, tax collectors, and the soldiers to love your neighbor as yourself. Don't lie. Don't steal. Don't take what is not yours if you claim to be a child of God. Don't take advantage of those who are weak or more helpless than you if you expect God to forgive you your sins. In other words, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And that's where we are to do ourselves if we desire to live lives of repentance. And that's why we, even we Christians, need to keep hearing the law preached, even if it's sometimes preached rather sternly. Because we too 
you need to be called to repentance if we're living contrary to what God's word says. And of course, this teaching of John the Baptist and John the Evangelist is no new teaching. The first sin in the garden was one of coveting, a desire to have more than what God had given. And of course, at this time of Christmas, it is good for us to review what it means to covet. Because all too often, we are more caught up in the buying of gifts or the getting of gifts than remembering the gift that was given to us by Christ. <coughs> Think about this as well. The first murder was one of jealousy and greed, of coveting, a desire to keep the best for themselves and give only what was second back to the Lord. Even the prophet Malachi preached this morning. And we do well to heed it today. God will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against, who, against those who thrust aside the sojourner. And do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. Even we, in these latter days, preparing for the coming of Christ, do well to remember that, again, we are to live lives of repentance. And this is why John speaks so harshly. The people did not fear the Lord. Even as we are tempted, they had become lazy and complacent. They had assumed their place in God's kingdom. And so they did not take seriously his word. They began to think that because they were descendants of Abraham, they were saved. We might be tempted to think that because we've been confirmed in the Lutheran church, we're saved. Not that confirmation is bad, but our faith and trust rests on the Lord and what he has done for us. You see, we can't just assume that because something happened in the past by like getting confirmed, that now we're good to go and can walk away from the church. Instead, we must keep coming back to hear God's word, repent, and receive the comforting joy of the gospel, which does tell us those who have been baptized have had their sins forgiven. In fact, the fruit of repentance is just as Jesus himself will teach his disciples to love others and be forgiven as we forgive. Just remember the Ten Commandments. They are to be kept. And not just for ourselves, because God has forgiven us, but rather for our neighbor who needs our good works of love for their sake. And God has shown us the same love by sending His Son, His only Son, and also the forerunner to preach this. Our God and Lord sent John, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, so that God's people would not feel God's wrath. Because yes, indeed, in John's baptism, we see a forerunner of our own baptism. You see, John was in the wilderness baptizing the people, proclaiming repentance and the forgiveness of sins, near the very spot where the people were first brought to Israel. Because it was through the waters of the Jordan River that the Lord brought his people into a land which he had promised them. In doing this, God was using John to call his people to remember all that their God had done in delivering them from their bondage and slavery over a thousand years before. And so we too, almost 2,000 years later, are reminded of where God first saved us when we remember our baptism. For what is holy baptism? Baptism is not just plain water. But it's the water included in God's command and combined with God's word. And what benefit does a little water poured over the head give? When that water is connected to God's word and is poured out in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, it works the forgiveness of sins, rescues from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe these words, just as God promises and declares. After all, what does such baptizing with water indicate? It indicates that the old Adam and us should by daily contrition and repentance be drowned and die with all evil desires and that a new man should daily arise and emerge to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. And so we who are God's people today, having heard this message, remember as well that that too 
is the fruit of repentance, isn't it? To live holy lives. You see, that is how all the baptized are to live. Both those who were baptized by John, those who were baptized by the apostles, and those who are baptized to this day. Recognizing that even the baptized are tempted to fall into sin, we return to the waters which has saved us. We go back to the promises of God made when he delivered us from the hands of our enemies, from sin, death, and from the devil himself. We go back and cling to what the Lord has done in saving us. Just as John called the people to repentance and gave them the promise of God's forgiveness in the water that he was pouring out. Remember what great promises God has given us in our baptism. St. Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And so again, whether it was John who preached, warned, and baptized then, or the pastor who continues to preach, warn, and baptize today, it is to Jesus that we are directed. For it is Jesus alone who died on the cross for our sins and rose again for our salvation. In baptism, what the Lord did in his coming is given to us, and we cling to it. For in baptism, we are connected to the cross. For those who believe the word and promise of God, we see in our baptism that the Lord has brought us into his promised land, into his heavenly, holy kingdom, through water and the word. And in baptism, with Christ alive in us, we have a new life. In humble repentance, believing what Jesus has done in delivering us from the devil, we know that we too have been given a new way to live. For we, as God's children, have been raised from death to live a new life. A life to live in love and service to our neighbor now. Even as we will one day be raised to a new and resurrected life to live with our Lord for all eternity. And all of this because a little water connected to the words and promises of God foretold going clear back to the people of the Old Testament. After all, John's message was not limited to only one time of repentance. Remember what the prophet Malachi said. Behold, I send my messenger. You prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. You see, even in the Old Testament, the gospel of Jesus Christ is proclaimed. Because it is in and through Christ alone that we see the God of our salvation. It's that preaching of salvation which alone saves us. For Jesus, the Lamb of God, is the one to whom John ultimately points. Because it is only through Christ and His shed blood that you receive the forgiveness of your sins. So John's message, harsh as it may sound, is ultimately what all Christian preaching is about. To call to repentance, which is the preaching of the law, and to proclaim Christ and Him crucified which is the gospel. And it is also a reminder that we ought to live as those who actually believe these words, not as a brood of vipers or hypocrites, but rather to live as God intends, loving one another as he first loved us. And so we do remember this Advent season, how God helps us to be pointed back to the Lamb who has died for our sins and has been risen again for our salvation. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.